Well, brethren, I wanted to talk a little bit today about something that I think all of us have to deal with in life. And as many of you know, life is, as I've often said, somewhat dynamic and can get overwhelming from time to time, can it not? It really can. I mean, in many cases, uh, the things that we've got going in our lives from all different types of angles and uh, different uh, locations and sources can sometimes drive us into areas of emotion and thought that, um, well, can get overwhelming. I mean, it really can, depending on how much responsibility you have, what you've accumulated over life, the things that uh, you find yourself exposed to uh, day in and day out. Uh, so many things can cause us uh, a lot of despair, depression in some cases, even drive us to despondency if we're not careful. Uh, on the positive side, we can get too happy, you know, and lose our bearings as well and sometimes go off the rails uh, because of certain things that happen to you. You hear of stories of people winning the lottery and all of a sudden they turn into this personality that they never, never thought uh, would be residing in them. But it just goes to illustrate that so many of us have what we call triggers, triggers that uh, sometimes do cause us to, as they say, go off the rails in one way or another that can even result in nervous breakdowns, uh, panic attacks, where sometimes these things get uncontrollable. You get overworked in some cases and uh, overloaded, as they say, in your mind, and you just emotionally, people get to a point where they cannot handle the pressures, the tension, the stresses, that they find themselves contending with and, and facing. And all of us have these potentialities. All of us have these vulnerabilities. We're all open to that kind of exposure in life because we're all subjected to so many varieties of different things that can affect and impact our lifestyles, our mental well-being, our emotional stability. And if we do not have this one thing that I want to talk about, Life, I'll tell you, can get pretty out of control pretty quickly if we're not careful. You know what that thing is? You know what that item is? What I want to talk about a little bit today is real simple. It's real simple. But if we don't have it, if we don't have at least some semblance of it, some degree of ingredient of it in our character, and in our ability to discipline ourselves within the framework of this characteristic, we are going to have a tough time going through life. As a matter of fact, in some cases, if we don't have this, we can make bad situations worse awfully quickly, and we can cause problems in our life that really could have been avoided, could have been avoided, if we would have just exercised this particular characteristic. You know what it is? You guessing? Self-control. Self-control. Self-control is an important, important ingredient that we all need to have because, as I say, sometimes if you don't have it and you can get caught off guard pretty quickly, before you know it, you're in over your head in circumstances and conditions that you sometimes could have honestly, you could have honestly avoided. If you would have just hold it up a little bit, thought a little bit, and, and considered the circumstances, the consequences, counted the cost, all these things, and then do what you think is the solution. Let me illustrate some things that are certainly stories in your Bible that resulted in certain events, conditions and circumstances, of which illustrate the lack <laughs> of self-control. Go back with me over here to Genesis for a moment. Genesis chapter 4, and I hope you do have your, your Bibles greased a little bit today because we are going to go through a jam-packed full of a bunch of scriptures here. Genesis chapter 4, you know the story of Cain and Abel, and very simply here in verse 8, bottom line is for a multitude of reasons, and you could perhaps put a whole sermon together on just the reasons why Cain slew his brother, but that's the bottom line here in verse 8. It says, and Cain talked with his brother Abel, in verse 8, chapter 4, book of Genesis, it came to pass when they were in a field, for some reason, Cain went ballistic. He lost it and killed Abel. Then he tries to cover it up. You know the story. Later on, God says, hey, where's your brother? 
you know, and God knew very well what happened, but the point of it is, and the story here that I want to illustrate for today's presentation, is that at some point in this discussion, in this interaction with his brother, his brother, this is not a stranger, it's not the neighbor, not that that would make it any better, but the point of it is, this was his brother. And there weren't very many people on earth <laughs> at this time. I mean, killing each other off is not the best thing to do. It's a lonely trip as it is when there's only four or five or six people on the whole planet. But he kills his brother, Abel. It may have been more than that, too, because remember, Adam and Eve had sisters, or uh, daughters, I'm sorry, daughters as well. So there may have been more than just uh, half a dozen people at this time. But the point is, he lost it, and of course, ended up killing his brother. Another story over here in Samuel. Go to 1 Samuel chapter 20. This is one I'm sure that many of you are familiar with. Uh, and in verse 30, I'm going to break into the context here. Uh, 1 Samuel, I think it is, chapter 20. And in um, I'm going to go up to verse 26. I'll break um, into the context up here in verse 26. Nevertheless, Saul, who was the king at this time of Israel, uh, was essentially having a feast on the Feast of Trumpets. It was the first day of Tishri. This was the first day, and they were keeping two days uh, of it uh, because that was their tradition at that time. Nevertheless, he says um, that uh, basically here in verse 20, end of 25, that he noticed that David's chair around the table was missing. Now, Jonathan, Saul's son, was David's best buddy. Okay, they were really close. They, they had a very good bond together, David and Jonathan. And as a result, they had, if you read chapter 20, an agreement because David was paranoid about Saul, Jonathan's dad, who was the king of Israel, that Saul was out to kill him. And Jonathan couldn't believe it. Jonathan wasn't convinced at this. And so they put a little pact together to make this determination and David wanting to prove his point. Here, the scheme begins to unfold, the plot, as they would say. And in verse 26, Saul notices, or 25, that David's seat is empty. So he says, uh, or he thinks basically to himself that, well, maybe he's not clean. Maybe he's uh, ceremonial Lee, uh, unclean, couldn't come to the feast for whatever reason. Uh, it comes to pass on the morrow after, the second day of the month, uh, David's place again is empty. Saul says to Jonathan, now, well, where's the son of Jesse? That was David. Uh, he wasn't here yesterday, and he's not here today. 28, Jonathan says, well, David earnestly asked, leave of me to go to Bethlehem to visit family, basically is what he's talking about. In verse 30, Saul gets angry. He takes this as a personal rub, and essentially uh, his anger is kindled against his own flesh and blood son, Jonathan. And he says to him, You son of the perverse, rebellious woman, do not I know that you've chosen the son of Jesse to thy own confusion, and under the com uh, confusion of your mother's nakedness? Saul was mad because he was paranoid also that David was the anointed to replace him as king, and he was kind of placating David along the lines, and David kind of knew that Saul was a little paranoid, and that's why Saul was killing him, although Jonathan, being somewhat naive to a certain extent and being more of the... The uh, idealist was hopeful that David was wrong about his dad, Saul. However, the story unfolds, and you find that David was not wrong about Saul, but that's another story that I'm going to leave for another time. I just want to focus on this, though, as we continue here to illustrate how angry Saul gets. He goes on, verse 31, For as long as the son of Jesse lives upon the ground, don't you understand, Jonathan? You shall not be established, nor thy kingdom. Wherefore, now send and fetch him to me, for he shall surely die. And Jonathan answered, Saul his father said unto him, Wherefore shall he be slain? What, what has he done? Why, why do you want to kill him? Jonathan stands up, kicks back at his dad. What do you want to kill him for? What did he do? Because that's his buddy, David. Look what Saul does. This is his son. Saul grabs a javelin, throws it at his son. Jonathan ducks. <laughs> he tried to kill him. He didn't, he didn't purposely miss him. 
This was, Saul was so angry. Look at this. Look what the Bible says. For as, um, verse 32, Jonathan answered Saul, his father, said, what did he do? 33, Saul casts a javelin at him to smite him, whereby Jonathan knew that it was determined of his father to slay David. In other words, if he's trying to kill me, <laughs> he's certainly going to try to kill David because I'm his son. David is, you know... I mean, he's from the, of, of the tribes of Israel, of course, but he's not his blood son in this respect. So, uh, needless to say, Jonathan arose from the table in fierce anger. So one ticked off the other and didn't even eat the second day of the month and was grieved. He was so disappointed. He was so upset about his father doing this. And David now being proved to be right. And it says here that he was so um, grieved because his father, as far as he was concerned, shamed him because of the anger that he expressed and the lack of self-control and the, the personality quirk that Saul manifested that literally almost took Jonathan out. He tried to kill him. Another story over here in Matthew. Follow me through this. Matthew chapter 26. Another story here. Many of you are very familiar with this. And in um, verse 69, Jesus is arrested, Garden of Gethsemane. They came, they got him, they now have him under control and essentially have taken him over to the high priest's area. Peter and John, of course, follow the group, and Peter uh, sat without in the palace. A woman comes up to him saying, You also were with that Jesus of Galilee, weren't you? And he denied before them all, saying, Look, I didn't know the guy. Remember, Jesus said you would... You would um, uh, what was that? Uh, deny, that's the word. <laughs> I almost panicked. <laughs> deny. <laughs> uh, three times. So this was one. He's out in the courtyard there with his buddy John, the other apostle. They followed Jesus over to the high priest's area. And verse 71, chapter 26, book of Matthew, here we read, And when he was gone out into the porch, another woman sees him, and says unto him, this fellow, he, he was with that Jesus of Nazareth. And again, he says, no, no, I didn't know him. Number two. Number two. And then verse 73, after a while comes unto him, uh, they that stood by and said to Peter, surely you are the one for your speech betrays you. We know who you are. You are with him. And he begins to curse and swear, because Peter was an old fisherman, you know, he, I'm sure he had a, quite a vocabulary. <laughs> but he says he begins to curse and swear, I didn't know the guy. And immediately we know the rooster crowed, and consequently uh, he wept and, of course, regretted everything. Their eyes met, and uh, Jesus, in another part of Scripture, uh, he was convicted in his own heart. One last story real quickly here I wanted to illustrate, again, circumstances that can occur when one loses self-control. Because here again, Peter illustrated in that story, certainly, that even language can get away from you, can't it, if you lose your temper. You can become, I, all of us in this room, I'm sure, have the potential of becoming pretty vulgar. Uh, if indeed we allow ourselves to be so and, and use some fairly choice words that are not necessarily found in the dictionary. <laughs> so we have to be careful about those things. Even Peter, even Peter here we see, though uh, unconverted at that time in the sense that he wasn't baptized, but, but the bottom line is still illustrating the potential of all of us uh, having these vulnerabilities. Here in Acts 15, you know the story here, a very well-known story with regard to the relationship of the Apostle Paul and Barnabas. And um, in this particular uh, case, we have Mark, who was in some way uh, related to Barnabas. Um, and here, verse 36, um, some days after, Paul says to Barnabas, this is Acts 15 and verse 36, 
Let's go again, Paul says with Barnabas, he, to Barnabas. He says, let, let, let's go again and visit the brother. Let's go on another trip. Let's go on one of these other evangelistic trips once more like we've been doing uh, and um, go to every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how everybody's doing since we've been there before. Let, you know, it's been quite a while since we were there again. So let's get on this circuit and go back. And uh, Barnabas determined to take uh, with them John, whose surname was Mark. Now, you have to read the story about what happened with John and uh, John Mark, I guess you could say his surname was Mark, because uh, what happened previous to this was uh, he got weak in the knees because of persecution that they were all facing in this one city that they were all at, and he abandoned them. He left them. He abandoned them right in the midst of the trip. So as far as Paul was concerned, this guy, this guy had no courage. This guy was kind of wimpy. He, yeah, I don't want to be with a guy like that. If, I want to, if I'm going to go in a foxhole, because we're going to get persecution, Barnabas. We, we know that. You know, they, they lowered me out of a window in a basket thinking I was dead. I was stoned one time outside of the city, and they, they thought I was dead. Uh, and may have been. I don't, I don't know. But, you know, the Apostle Paul's job description wasn't what you really would like to, to have as far as doing what he did for a living. And the point was that uh, Paul wanted people he could count on. And uh, John Mark was just not one of those guys, at least at this point, in um, Paul's mind. However, uniquely enough, Mark does come full circle. And later on in the scriptures, you'll find, I think it's in Timothy, that Mark is actually now re-ingratiated back to Paul. And Paul is looking to him to help him uh, out in some respects. But at any rate... Here's the point I wanted to make. I digress. Paul thought, no, 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 not good to take this guy with them, uh, who departed from them uh, when they were in Pamphylia and went not with them to the work. And the contention, the contention, this, this um, uh, anger and uh, this, what you could say, exasperation was so sharp between them that they could not work together. The difference of opinion was just so uh, hard between them that they could not work together in this regard. Paul went his way, Barnabas went his way. Uh, Paul later on took Silas, I think it was, with him as uh, Barnabas then went ahead and took uh, John Mark. But the bottom line here is that, as you can see, if self-control doesn't really enter into many situations, you can find yourself, brethren, in many respects, destroying relationships, hurting people that you didn't mean to hurt. You can find uh, words coming out of your mouth that perhaps you wish they wouldn't, and in retrospect, regret they did because of certain hurt and harm that maybe those words uh, Im, uh, impact other people by. And they don't have to be vulgarity either. They could just be insults, uh, frankly, or rumors. I mean, rumors are really, really hurtful. I mean, you start talking about somebody else behind the back of someone else to impinge malice or to disclose information about them to a third party that other people have no bearing or business to know. I mean to tell you, those can be hurtful. Those kinds of things uh, can be very, very hurtful. And you've got to be very careful about things that you are privy to, especially uh, in, in congregations uh, where we're, uh, we have a, fa a familial environment here in church community, that if indeed loving one another, we do indeed love one another, that uh, if in fact things are disclosed about each other, uh, uh, that we do keep those confidential and leave them, that is, that information to the individual to disperse uh, as they see fit and deem necessary if and when they feel uh, it's right. Because as the Bible says, if there's one member, if there's one member in the church that is the most unruly member in all the churches throughout all the world, it's the tongue. <laughs> it's the tongue. That member is definitely very unruly, as pointed out in the book of James. But over here in Romans chapter 7, I want to point something out here, because this chapter, though we didn't go to it yet, nevertheless, this presentation kind of sets this chapter up in some regards uh, from at least one angle, and that is the, the angle I'm talking about today, because in one segment of this chapter 7 that is up next for us to cover, illustrates <clears throat> this one part of how we battle ourselves. 
We are involved in a war to control our minds and consequently control ourselves, self-control. And here we read, uh, for that which I do, Paul says, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that's what I do. If then I do that which I wouldn't, I consent unto the law that it is good. In other words, that the law, if I do commit adultery, if I do lie, I'm conceding to the law that that's good. When it, the law is telling me it's not. <laughs> so I'm compromising myself. And I'm not controlling myself to not lie, to not uh, put something in front of God, to forget the Sabbath day. Things that are, are very, very uh, instrumental and very simple in the performance of our lives. But because we don't discipline ourselves, we let ourselves become gods unto ourselves and put ourselves in front of God, it's easy for us in not expressing that self-control to go off the rails. And so often we as human beings do go off the rails because we insert ourselves first. Instead of loving God first, we love ourselves first and hence serve our own appetites and our own lusts and our own pride and vanity first before we think about what that is reflecting in terms of God living in us. And therein lies where we get into a lot of the trouble that uh, Paul is attempting to illustrate here uh, in, as he articulates what this battle's all about. Verse 17, Romans 7, Now then, it is no more I that does this, but the sin that dwells in me. It's this lust of the eyes. It's this lust of the flesh. It's this vanity of mine that wants me to be important, that wants me to have people think that I'm the top dog, that I'm so great, that I've got the, you know, the, the uh, presence and uh, the uh, need and, and certainly reasonable justification for accolades. That, that's what gets people in trouble, wanting attention looking for always to be number one, competitiveness. Paul says it's this desire, this what John said, lust of the eyes, flesh, and pride of life, those three accesses into the human spirit that oftentimes trips us up because we get too focused on that stuff, on how to, how to satisfy and satiate our own appetites. Verse 18, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwells no good thing. For to will, I, I, I want to do different, Paul says, I know in me to will, I, I know what I should do, but uh, just one more time isn't going to hurt. I'll just do it one more time. It, it feels so good. Or I, I, I want to, to you know, buy this or buy that, even though, well, I'm only $100,000 in debt. What's $10,000 more? You know? <laughs> And we find ourselves doing uh, more damage to ourselves because we don't bridle these pulls uh, because he says here, as he, he recognizes, for to will and pre is present with me, to know to do good. I know, but how to perform that which is good? This is verse 18. I find not. In other words, he doesn't recognize the discipline or, or execute the discipline. For the good that I would, I don't do or I do not. But the evil which I would not, that's what I end up doing. Now, if I do that, I would not. It's no more I that's doing it, but it's the sin that dwells in me. In other words, it's this lust of the eyes, it's this lust of the flesh, it's this vanity that's in me that drives me to do the things that I'm doing that oftentimes I find myself now, as a result, the consequence being I'm in trouble or I'm off the rails, as I say. I went off the reservation and again, I find myself uh, in separation from God. So the question comes to mind, and, and certainly it is something that I want to talk about today specifically. How do we acquire a better sense of self-control? What is it that we could do that could help us be able to implement better self-control? Well, I've got a few items I'd like to share with you that should enhance your technique. The first one is obvious, 
and I think was very blaring and underscoring many of the stories that I shared with you, uh, of those four uh, stories that I shared with you, that was the cause of some of the behaviors that came out of Cain, out of Saul, Peter, and so on. And that is, number one, control your anger. Control your anger. You've heard of uh, the um, statement anger management. You know, if you've got problems with anger, get some books on how to control your anger. Get some books that will go into different little techniques and nuances of what to do. Things that are very simple in, in some cases, like count to ten. Or get your mind off of what's causing you to be angry. Little nuances of tell the person, you know, have these little uh, signals, even if it's your mate or maybe it's one of uh, your, your children. Say, hey, time out, time out. Let's not talk about it right now. We're too emotionally uh, involved in this. Let's uh, come back at it. Uh, let's see. Let's, let's come back at it next week. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying. Control the anger and learn the techniques that need to be in order to get your emotions distilled. Very, very important. Since we're in the book of Romans, turn with me to Romans chapter 12 for a moment. Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12 and in verse 17. Recompense no man evil for evil. That was Jonathan's problem. When Saul, his dad, got angry. What did Jonathan do? He got angry. He got fiercely angry. He responded in like manner. Well, what does that do? That accelerates the situation. You've just put gasoline on a fire. A proverb tells you immediately, proverb, I mean, if there's one proverb, brethren, you need to ingrain in your brain and always remember as a specific underscoring, underpinning technique and method to control a situation is a soft answer turns away wrath. And as much as you want to take a billy club or a baseball bat to this individual who's confronting you with something that they just told you or that they just insulted you with, nevertheless, <clears throat> a soft answer turns away wrath. That's important. That's important. Because here, you're told by Paul, recompense no man evil for evil. If you go down to the same level as the individual contending with you, you're doing no good for the situation. You're doing no good for reconciliation. You're doing no good for making peace. Notice what Paul continues to say here in verse 17 of Romans 12. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. Don't justify yourself. Don't take a, a posture that you're above reproach. Try to be neutral and be honest with the situation. Consider the fact that, yeah, you know what? You may be culpable in this too. So give the individual who's expressing to you some discomfort a chance to voice their opinion as well. And listen. Don't be while they're talking thinking about how you're going to retort because then you're not listening. You're just trying to figure out how to wiggle out and how to deflect back. No, 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 no. Use the conversation for an edification, for an edifying experience so that maybe perhaps you can learn something in the process. Verse 18, notice this. If it's possible, as much as it lies in you, live peaceably with all men. Oh, I remember some guys I used to work with. Oh, boy. I mean, I'll just tell you this one situation. We were, I was with a company, and we were considered basically a bunch of rogues in the water treatment industry. I mean, we were, our headquarters, i just give you an idea that you can contrast in your mind and make it, make it you think what you want to think, but we were headquartered in El Paso, Texas. That was our culture. It was kind of cowboy boots and jeans, and we go in and, and just sell water treatment equipment, and that's the way we did business. And a company called Millipore bought us, and they were all these Harvard, Yale-educated guys, uh, and their headquarters was in Boston, and they were real high tech. And those two, uh, what you could say, corporate cultures were brought together under the purchase of Millipore buying the company that I worked for that was headquartered in El Paso called Continental Water. 
And needless to say, oh boy, the personality conflicts that uh, you had to work with and so forth. I came out of it pretty good. I, I was a regional sales manager, but some of the guys that were working for me who were educated in Harvard and Yale to win their respect with me not necessarily having a Harvard and Yale education was like trying to uh, put um, uh, a building fire out with a spoonful of water. I mean, it was just uh, very, very hard to get into and to work through some compatibilities. And needless to say, some of the, res some of the relationships that developed were very, very difficult. In some cases, quite frankly, you'd like to just take a baseball bat to some of these guys, you know, because you just couldn't get them to, to respond the way that you needed to respond because they were too concerned about, you know, hey, uh, you, I've got a higher education than you and I don't need to listen to you. And that's my point. My point is that we have conflicts and incompatibilities that we have to deal with and that sometimes it's not the easiest thing to be peaceable with all men. Nevertheless, Paul said, if possible, be uh, focused on trying to live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place. That is, eliminate anger. Eliminate anger, Paul says. For it is written, vengeance is God, uh, mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Verse 20, therefore, if your enemy hungers, feed him. If he thirsts, give him drink. For in so doing, you sh uh, shall heap coals of fire on his head. And verse 21, certainly underscoring all of this, don't uh, be not overcome of evil. Don't let evil overcome you, but overcome evil with your good. Be counter-distinctive. Be counterproductive in that regard and attempt to try to neutralize the evil with your goodness and your ability to self-control yourself and navigate through the circumstances and the situation uh, you find yourself in. Over here in Ephesians chapter 4, again, in controlling anger, we're advised by, again, once more, Paul. In verse 26 of chapter 4, we read this, Be you angry, but don't sin. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Very important technique here. What Paul is saying is don't let yourself get to a point where you become bitter. Don't let it prolong. Don't let it go on. Don't let it continue. Nip it in the bud. By nature, we as human beings, and I know this because I'm like this, and I don't mind confronting, but I'm like this. Even though I don't mind confronting, I'm still like this. I don't like to confront. I'll be honest with you. If I can avoid confrontation, I will do it in a New York minute. However, I'm not afraid to confront, but I have found over the years, I have found over uh, the few years that I've lived on this earth that the best way to handle confrontation is to do it quickly. <laughs> don't, let, don't let time go on. Don't let time day after day after day continue and continue, especially husbands and wives. I mean, if there's a rift that's developing, address it. Address it. Face off with each other. You know, go get a bottle of wine, sit down and discuss it, you know. Uh, do, do, do something, though, that will put to rest whatever the rift that's growing and developing is quickly. And that's what P, uh, Paul is saying here, essentially, is giving us insight on don't let your anger ferment because the fermentation will ultimately turn sour. Notice this over here in Hebrews chapter 12, and here's ultimately where it will lead if you're not careful. And the writer of Hebrews, whom I also think is Paul, but nevertheless uh, provides a very uh, salient item here to consider in Hebrews chapter 12. And in verse 11, I'll break into the context here. No chastening, and the context is God is chastening this individual for some reason. For the present, when you're going through a trial, it seems to be joyous. Rather, it's grievous. It feels grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, nevertheless, if you take the, the what you could say, uh, lesson that's involved in this chastening, you will come out better for it on the other end if you allow God to have his way with you. But of course, uh, that takes a, a bit of patience. Nevertheless, the recommendation here is in verse 11, uh, the word, I pick it up, nevertheless, afterward it yields a peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Therefore, lift up your hands which hang down and the feebleness make straight your paths for your feet, lest you which is lame be turned out of the way, and let it rather be healed. Follow peace 
with all, and holiness without, which no man shall see the Lord. Look diligently, lest any man fail or fall away from the grace of God lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you and thereby may be defiled. And, and uh, essentially there what he's saying is, look, that's what's going to happen. It's going to uh, grow into bitterness to the point where if whatever that riff or in, uh, problem was, though it may not have been that big of a deal if it would have been nipped in the beginning when it was in the bud... Now, two years later, six months later, three months later, becomes bigger than what it was. Why? Because we as human beings have a tendency, and we all do this, we tend to develop straw man images of circumstances and situations that we find ourselves involved with, and the more time we give to ferment those conjured up ideas of what we think you're thinking of me in that situation that we're involved with is dangerous. Because all of a sudden what emerges and, and finds itself uh, coming up into, this, into the circumstances are things that don't exist. They only exist in our minds <laughs> because we allow them to grow through the angst that the situation has brought on between us. So don't let that time uh, occur. Don't let it um, ferment. Don't let it have uh, its um, way with you in that regard. Learn to manage it. Shift your attention if you have to. Leave the attention. Remind yourself also, and this is important, this is important. Remind yourself that it's okay to be angry. I mean, if you're angry, that's okay. It's okay. Just don't get to the point where you're condemning. In other words, if you're angry, go to the person. Go to the person. What uh, Matthew tells us in Matthew 16, you've got something with somebody, hey, don't hesitate. Go to that individual first and Tell them, look, you know what? I don't know if you know this or not, but you offended me. Now, that person may say, I did? Or, yeah, you're darn right I did. Because <laughs> you deserve it. Well, you know what? That's healthy conversation. That's healthy conversation in your relationship if indeed I want to recover my relationship. Because the only way I'm going to do it is to go through it and tell you why I'm upset. Or you tell me why you're upset. Because I may say, well, I didn't know that. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't realize it. And guess what? Oh, you didn't? And then all of a sudden, everything is okay. And it was easier in some cases than you might th thought it was. But the reality of it is, is that if it's not done quickly, you may find yourself building mountains out of molehills. Number two. Number two. Got one? Control your anger. Number two. Learn to stop unwanted thoughts. Jesus said, I'm going to, for the sake of time, just reference Matthew 5. You know uh, what he referenced there, which was a clear, plain indication. Things begin in our thoughts. Jesus said, I tell you that if you hate a person, you've killed them in your heart. If you look on a woman and say, man, I'd like to hop in bed with her. Whew, she's hot. You've committed adultery in your heart. It's in the thoughts. It's in the thoughts. Jesus knew that. Get at the thoughts. Stop the thoughts. This goes back to the three R's in self-control. You recognize, you resist, and then you replace. That's self-control. All of a sudden, your mind is wandering. And don't think it won't. Brethren, we are all potentially vexed by a spirit world. I hate to break the news to you, but we are all subjected to the influences of mood changes, whether we want to attribute them to testosterone or to um, estrogen <laughs> for the ladies. <laughs> We, whatever it may be that we want to attribute certain mood changes to that cause our thoughts to go certain ways 
or whether or not we want to attribute it to some external object that caused us or a song we're listening to the radio brings back memories and we start going down memory lane and we get angry or we get happy or whatever it may be. These things all play into our, our lives and it's important that we recognize whatever it may be that's starting to upset us immediately so that we then take action to resist via, and this is, the, this is the simplest technique, you will resist it as you learn how to replace it. Replace it will automatically fall out with and play out with resisting it. It's, uh, in, in that regard, uh, an easy methodology to, um, uh, to implement. We've already talked about Romans uh, chapter 12 and in verse 21 where it says, don't let evil overcome you, but overcome the evil with the good. Well, let me go and bring your attention to Philippians chapter 4, because here Paul gives us some alternatives of thinking that if indeed we begin to implement and deploy in our, psych our psychology will help us along the way to better replace uh, with um, uh, our efforts to resist. In verse 8, Philippians chapter 4, we read this. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and that... Um, Virtue means excellence. If, there, if there's any excellence, valor, if there's any valor in these things, if there be any praise, think on these things, those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me, Paul says, do, and the God of peace shall be with you. The whole book, uh, not the whole book, the whole chapter of Colossians chapter 3. Let me give you some homework. Read Colossians chapter 3. I don't have the time to go through it, uh, but I will just reference this. Uh, first verse in Colossians chapter 3. If you then be risen with Christ, in other words, what Paul is talking to those who are baptized, because we who have come up out of the waters, remember that uh, imagery that we talked about in the book of Romans through the chapters that we've already covered, 1 through 6, we talked about a baptism, I think, over there in chapter 5. When you come up out of the water, it is a representation of a resurrected new you connected to the fact of a resurrected new Christ who is a spirit being upon his resurrection. And that, that uh, metaphor, that, that analogy, that uh, figure of speech, symbolism, is also indicative of us and how we should be when we come up out of the water in baptism. And when we come up out of the water in baptism, Paul is challenging those of us who are baptized by saying, if you're risen with Christ, then seek those things which are above. In other words, your base nature now is no longer in the equation. What you used to do and how you used to uh, go ahead and handle things no longer applies. Paul is saying, you seek those things which are above, that are of Christ, where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Set your affection or your mind on things above not on the things on the earth. For you're dead and your life, this is all symbolic, figure of speech, but your old nature, that old person that represented my persona when I was prior to or previous to my baptism is dead. Is dead. So I don't feed that personality anymore. I'm not that person anymore. I, it, I'm trying to be different. And so I'm taking on different actions and activity to try to change the direction of my persona so that I don't react the old way I used to. And therefore it's important and it begins to uh, be critical for us to make sure that we are in that kind of control and self-reflection along the way as we go through life. In other words, slow yourself down and think before you act. Because remember, brethren, what underscores all of this? If you're baptized, you represent Jesus Christ. You represent Jesus Christ. You don't represent yourself. I don't represent Bill Watson anymore. I'm carrying a badge 
I'm carrying a cloak. I, I've got it written all over me. Why do I? Because I do certain things. I've often said, you know, I'm asking for days off. I don't work on Saturday on, on the job. You know, I don't, I don't um, keep Christmas and Easter, but I need a day off for the Feast of Trumpets and the Day of Atonement. And I, I come across as this kind of religious guy, but then when I go to my locker, I open it up and I got all these girly things on my locker, you know, from Playboy and so on. Well, how does that make sense? You know, well, that, that makes absolutely no sense. And don't think people aren't connecting those dots with you. Don't think they're not connecting those dots and saying, ha, this guy thinks he represents Christ? Ha, somebody help me, you know. He's not anywhere near Christ no more than I am. He swears, he does this, he smokes, he drinks, he's, he's out every night on Friday nights. He says he keeps his Saturday and he's out on Friday nights. Yeah, he's just taking Saturday off. That's what he's doing. He doesn't want to work the weekends. That's what he's doing. Don't think that you're not watched and are actually having people connect the dots. So you need, you need to make sure that immediately you don't entertain evil and malicious thoughts about things, inert, or people, organic. Don't do that. Point number three, commit to breaking habits. In other words, really dedicate yourself to analyzing yourself on committing to change your habits. We have certain patterns. I've often said this. You've heard me say it before. We have certain patterns. We have certain coping mechanisms, certain comfort zones that we naturally fall into. Why? Because they're comfortable. They're comfortable. It's the way I think. I think better when I'm comfortable. But oftentimes, those old mechanisms of coping with things were our problem. That's what was keeping us from making the kind of progress that we need to be making if indeed we want to reflect Christ in our life. And so what we've got to do is we've got to begin to change those patterns and the way we process information and begin to think about how we can respond differently. Maybe we spend too much time doing this or doing that. Maybe not enough time doing this or doing that. You know what I'm talking about. Only you know the lifestyles that you have. I can't sit up here and pontificate what you need to do absolutely. And you know, you should pray 15 minutes a day. Ten times a day, you know. You can't say that. But I will say this. You should be praying every day. <laughs> you should be praying every day. I will say this, that if you're not opening up your Bible except from Sabbath to Sabbath, you need to improve that. You need to take some time and study your Bible. And I don't mean just read it. I mean study it. E even if you have to maybe prepare fictitious presentations, or go through your notes and type the notes out. However, however it is that would help you to better digest the information that you are gathering, it's important, brethren, that if indeed you're committed to changing your habits, that you really do begin to take some time to prove this stuff. I'm not keeping Christmas anymore. Well, why not, Billy? Well, Mom, I'll tell you. It's not Christian. What? What do you mean it's not Christian? All your life, Billy. That's my mother talking to me. I heard, I heard her many years ago. What do you mean it's, it's all? Why, I was brought up in the Eastern Orthodox Church and they taught us Christmas was Christian? And you're saying Christmas is not Christian? No, I'm not keeping it anymore, Mom. What? What do you mean you're not keeping it anymore? I'm not keeping it. It's pagan. It's not from Christ. It's not in the Bible. I got to know why. So I go and I study and I find out. And I don't even have to read literature from CGI. I can go to any encyclopedia and find out that it's not Chris, Christian. Whether it's Easter, you know, whether it's Sunday or Saturday, all these things, basic fundamental things that have changed my lifestyle because I changed habits. I had to. I had to change my friends. I had to abandon certain people that were dragging me back into my old coping mechanisms. And sometimes you have to do that. Sometimes it takes drastic measures. Sometimes you can salvage some of your old friends. 
depending on how aggressive they are in dragging you back to your old coping mechanisms. But sometimes you can't. You've got to cut the line. You've got to cut that tether and say, you know what? If I'm going to change my habits. I've got to start changing my friends <laughs> and not go out you know, with those same old uh, folks that used to drag me into these particular uh, means and ways. Luke 21, verse 19. I wrote that down for some reason. Let me go back here and see what we wrote it down for. Luke 21. Luke 21 and in verse 19. Yeah. In your patience possess your souls, and rightly so, because the fact of it is this doesn't come easy. Sometimes it's very difficult. You have to be patient. You have to allow God to have his way with you. James 1, verse 4. I'll just reference that as well as Romans 5, verse 3. Romans 5, verse 3. All talk about patience. And in your patience, as you work through the changing of these habits, you know, whether you're, you're sloppy about certain things, maybe you're reckless about certain things, you begin to now develop, you know, better, more self-aware habits. I remember how when I was young, I would lose my wallet. I would never, uh, you know, I'd, I'd lose my ID. So I had to start taking actual thought about where is my wallet, where is my ID, uh, and consequently became more responsible. And that lends itself to this. You've got to hold yourself accountable. You've got to hold yourself accountable for the actions that you engage yourself in. And the, uh, the patience that it takes in order to work through some of these changes certainly will require you to take your time through it. And uh, sometimes, obviously, you have to do things that are uncomfortable, like fessing up to your own culpability and your own uh, level and degree of responsibility that... Um, you have in whatever the situation may be in the habit that you're attempting to try and change. Now also with this, because habits don't change by themselves, habits don't change by themselves. If you're really serious about this, and we go through this during the Feast of uh, Unleavened Bread and during Passover season, focus on something. Focus on something. Zero in on something that you want to change. In other words, set a goal. Set a goal. And then somehow come to some kind of understanding about how you're going to measure that progress against that goal. Are you making good progress? And you can gauge the metric development or the change of the metric in your life by the goal that you're, the short term goals that you're setting on how you can um, overcome that. So, uh, as you try and do this, don't forget Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30, and that is to include God in all of this, especially if you're a baptized member, also if you're not baptized. The fact of it is God is there watching over you, whether he's in you or around you on the outside. He's looking to you to be accountable, to be patient, allow him to have his way with you, and to come to him. Matthew 11 talks about you who are heavily laden. Remember that presentation I gave some months ago on going through that. Well, then come to me. I'll give you rest. Sometimes you just got to put it in God's hands, brethren. It's outside of your control. Sometimes when you've done all that you can do, you cannot obsess over it. You've got to release it and let it go and let God own it, hoping that your appeals and your uh, invoking to him will help it to work out in a pleasant way that hopefully it will result in a win-win for everybody. Last one, item four. This is important, brethren. Understand and know God values your worth. God loves you. God has a great investment in all of us, brethren. First of all, and I'll just reference Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 through 31 because time's running out on me here. You were created in God's image. You were created in God's image. And you were created for the purpose of, and you can read about this in Hebrews 2, 5 through 9, and again, I'll just reference it, to become essentially born sons into the God family to inherit all that there is to inherit. Tonight, you know, we had a full moon a few days ago, uh, and you could go outside I did it on a couple of uh, nights because it was pretty big, the moon, on both nights. 
And I think this is the first month now past the feast. So we're in a new month now from the Feast of Tabernacles. But the bottom line was, I, I oftentimes will do this. I'll go up and remind myself that, wow, that's my playground coming up. That's going to be part of my world at some point in my life. And I always remind myself of that because guess what? It gets my eyes off of this because this is not all there is. There is far more to your life. This is just the beginning. And young people need to recognize that as well as us older folks need to recognize that this is just the beginning where God is leading us tonight. Go out, look up in the sky. That's where God is leading you. Ultimately, Hebrews chapter 2, you can read it there, is all that is all yours there, and it's your promise. John 3.16, you know that, John 3.16, that uh, God gave his only begotten son, that we may have eternal life and should not perish. You know that scripture. Read this chapter in the book of Psalms, if you can tonight. Another bit of homework. Colossians chapter 3 and this one. Psalms 139. Psalms 139. Take some time, quiet time. Just go through that. Read it slowly and let it sink in because it's about you and your value. Your value to God. Psalms 139. And of course, 1 Peter 2 verse 9. 1 Peter 2 verse 9 which says that you're a holy people a chosen generation. You're special as far as God is concerned. And consequently, he has uh, plans for you and uh, for me. So keep these four points in mind. Control your anger. Learn to stop unwanted thoughts. Commit to breaking bad habits. Dedicate some effort and energy. Get, get really down into the weeds with that. I mean, it's going to take some thoughts. Set some goals really establish some methods by which you can measure some intrinsic and, and actual progress in the uh, commitment that you're making to breaking old habits and old coping mechanisms. And understand and accept the fact that you are very valuable to God. God does, in fact, love you very, very much and uh, certainly doesn't want anything to happen to you that would be counterproductive, that would be counterproductive to bringing full return on the investment he's made on you. And full return on investment for you is birthing you, actually changing you from mortal flesh to spirit and putting you into his family as a born son of God so that you might inherit all things, which is what your destiny's all about. Brethren, if you do these four points, I know for sure, I'll guarantee it, it'll help you to become more self-controlled and more successful at it.